all four very, very uh, interesting, thought-provoking um, uh, introduction. We're gonna, what we're gonna do, we're pressed for time. So we're gonna, uh, I wanna stop at 12. So at 12 o'clock I can start taking questions. So we're gonna, for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is to have a discussion amongst the um, panel members. In each of your introduction, you've all touched on an area of, of real importance to me. And I just want to just open up um, on a question. I, I want to end with um, Dr. R. Day, actually, because I think he also mentioned um, the, uh, he actually threw a question out there. So my question is, I've been looking, um, in March 2020, the Royal Society of, uh, uh, for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacture and Commerce, I don't know if you're familiar with their report, but they carried out a report on the review and pre prevention of school exclusion. And um, when Martha was speaking, she did actually mention to say some of these conversations will be uncomfortable. So um, from the report, the findings highlighted that um, there is a discrimination application in behavior policy within schools. During their interview with several uh, young people and uh, parents, uh, the experience of discrimination within school behavior management system highlighted that black, Asian and ethnic minority young people uh, were punished for minor action that uh, such as fist bumping. And I know that might seem as something very, uh, very trivial, but they do get uh, discipline for something as simple as that. And the report show that uh, evidence that children are more likely to be excluded uh, for fixed term and permanent. Uh, and this is higher in the black, Asian and ethnic minority uh, uh, population, particularly the black Caribbean children. So I just want to ask all the panel members. So I'll start again with Martha first uh, being a uh, head teacher within Greenwich. I think she'll be able to shed some light and share her own experience and give us some more food for thoughts. And I'll go in that alphabetical order and I'll then end with uh, Dr. Arde. So what I want to know is uh, with the rate of um, BME children uh, being so high in the school exclusion, is there any academic studies that you've come across that has um, shed further lights on this? What is your understanding and um, is there anything you think as a borough we can uh, do to help to support our schools? Uh, because he did mention um, the, you know, the, dis the disproportionate rate um, and uh, how the education system are not fair. And I think that came across in all your uh, introductions. So I'll open up to Martha and then I'll move on to Dr. Jivraj and, and then Caroline and then finish with Jason. So I'll just throw it out there. Um, Martha? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that um, in terms of the high rate of black boys being excluded, I think a lot of it is about our relationships with black boys. Um, I think it's really important that children see themselves. Um, they recognise themselves in the teachers and the educators around them. I know from my personal experience as a um, teacher starting out in their career, I was given a lot of the children that were labelled as difficult and challenging, and I didn't find them difficult or challenging. But I think that it's around our relationships with those children and understanding them and actually for us oh. building those positive relationships that the expectation is that the children will learn. The expectation is that we have high expectations of them. And it's about them being able to relate relate to um, their teachers and I think the more diversity we can have in schools it brings about a real richness to the curriculum it brings around um, children understanding that people that are different from themselves and that they have the opportunity to learn from each other I think it's really important and we know that there's a disproportionate amount of black leaders within not only the local authority within within the country and until we start addressing this balance I think the statistics are just going to get higher and higher but um there's a lot of work to do with regards to that and I think it's how black boys are viewed um and how the stereotypes are reinforced within the education system
I can't hear, sorry, I can't hear. I will stay unmuted because uh, every time I mute, it takes a while to come back in. Um, so uh, thank you very much. That's very helpful um, that you've actually uh, mentioned the relationship. And I think that is crucial uh, for uh, the relationship within schools between our black boys and teachers and the school system to improve. Um, Dr. Jivraj, I don't know if you want to um, share just, some of your... Just quickly to absolutely... Um agree with what uh, Martha has said I think you know by the time that the students um, have got to me uh, when they reach when they're 18 19 you know they've already been through hell so it's even more um, and and they've got their you know against all the odds <laughs> and they are tired and uh, and then they don't you know we have a huge population of students of color and uh, black students in particular and then you know they get there and they hardly see anyone that looks like them I remember one student said to me oh my god you know when I saw X uh, it was like seeing a unicorn and I just ran to them <laughs> um, so happy and this person didn't know <laughs> what was going on but you know that's the that's the impact it has and I totally agree that relationship and that's why as I said I'm so lucky that I see every single student in first year and then they have the option to come back to another module I teach in the final year or contact me or get involved with stuff uh, in between and it's having those people that students can go to that they feel trust in that they know will believe in them um, that is really key and I, just to say finally that you know in my law school we have two of the third the only 35 black female professors in this country and we have two and one of them was um, up until recently our head of school and we wouldn't have been able to do what we did if we hadn't had her you know ahead of us so standing on shoulders and collective solidarity in that way is really key for the students and and you know us as the teachers as well thank you very much i'm um, straight over to Ms. Okamuni. hi hi um yeah it's a very complicated one for me because i think there is clearly a problem in relationship to black boys attainment but we also have to recognize the ways in which class is a protective factor for black boys. We must recognize that there are black boys who are doing very well, very, very well, exceptionally well. And I think there is a danger of ignoring their successes as well when we focus on a small group. I don't do data or statistics. I come from a literary background. I just read novels, but it seems to me that you know, one of the dangers is that the small proportion and, you know, data does not tell us precisely how many people are affected, but the small proportion is there is a danger that we focus on them to the exclusion of all other groups. Um, I don't know what Soraya thinks, but the one thing that I've noticed in higher education is that the majority of BME students, particularly African and African Caribbean students are women they are not men so you know there is there is a prop there are also problems in relationship to the fact that, i mean i can't remember the last time i saw a group of young black men at university that would be quite an extraordinary sight but you see women all of the time so we haven't also as people in higher education really fully thought through how is the impact of young boys in our education system and our failure to get them through, maybe it's the institution that I work at, our failure to get them through the various levels of education, how is that impacting on our cultural experience as black people, our experiences in terms of our families as black people and our experiences in terms of our communities. We need to look at, for me, much more broadly and recognize the problem is a global problem. Everywhere you go in the world where there is a racial hierarchy, you can go to Brazil, you can go to the Caribbean, you go to America. There is the constant problem of the under attainment of black boys. We need to see this as a global problem rather than something which is particular to the UK. And perhaps looking at it as a global problem might allow us different ways into understanding exactly what the nature of the problem is and how to start dealing with it. 
Thank you very much, Carolyn. And uh, Dr. Ade, I know you, you said um, we need to think about how we change the education system and how we facilitate, facilitate that change. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate more on that in terms of um, uh, exclusion and being a uh, black man yourself in terms of the experience and what you've seen. I don't know if you could um, talk a little bit on that as well, please. Thank you so much, Councillor Williams. Um, I guess like um, everyone's kind of articulated a lot better than I could have ever done. So, and I think what is really interesting is um, I think the exclusion thing that there is a clear pipeline between exclusion for prison, um, particularly in the case of uh, young black males. And I guess one of the things that I'm kind of really intrigued, or I always think require requires some sort of intrigue, is to think about what are the patterns within classroom spaces. How do implicit and conscious biases impact on these contexts, um, particularly in terms of labelling? And we know that that happens a lot with um, black students, generally speaking, and ethnic minority students, but particularly black students. Um, I think in terms of my own experiences, my own experiences are probably slightly different only because um, I'm autistic. So my experiences have been they, they've been really different in the context of like I, I I didn't learn I didn't speak until I was 11 and I didn't learn to read and write until I was 18 so my, my experiences have been really different in terms of how I conceptualized the world and my understanding of it and it was really always a case of navigating um, that first and then race second if that makes sense um, because I guess um, in some ways I never tried to conceal my race but in terms of my autism you know I tried to conceal it within the nature of my life so it, those experiences are kind of they're not symbiotic they're, they're very different and my own experience would be having been a physical education P, been a physical education teacher when I was in school was that um, the impact that somebody that looks like you can have on students both ways is a really visceral thing so for me, working in the school and being a teacher in the school, I always say it's the best job I ever had because it was the job where I could see the biggest difference being made, particularly over a three to five year stretch. And it was that, it was kind of aspects of the hidden curriculum that become really important within them. So it was those conversations around, you know, what you're doing off the call today, doing the right things, getting people involved in the right projects. And actually the thing that I always knew, um, which just became exacerbated when I became a school teacher, was that um, these are some of the most gifted minds you could ever come across. But if you don't nurture and water that talent in the right way, then obviously, um, you know, it will go awry. And that can be applied to anyone. But I guess the systemic and institutional racist part of that is that very often the talents of young black people aren't nurtured in the same way as it has been for young white people within our education system and I know there'll be a counter argument in terms of the white working class but actually we still know that the outcomes are completely different you could have someone that gets to you know master's level and still wouldn't get the same outcome as a white working class person you may not have that that kind of capital so racism still plays out in that visceral way particularly when you walk in an interview situation and I think it's important to kind of draw on some of the things that have been said as well I think these experiences are completely exacerbated for black women. Um, and it's really important to acknowledge that because um, there, isn't a, there, is, there is a complete disaggregate and a fair advantage in being a black man and the politicization of black men that doesn't work in the same way with black women. Um, and it's completely different. And in terms of the labor of race work, historically it's been done by black women. And if I'm being honest, black men have profited from that and actually there are times when they haven't been um for want of a better term there in the trenches they haven't been there um shouldering that labor shouldering that burden and that kind of always say or my mum always says you turn up for the champagne moments so it is really important to kind of think about how we engage in that kind of collective sense of resistance and activism and mobilization of race equality and really ensure that you know in doing that we're preparing you know young black men come to society in a way that helps them to facilitate you know black women society more generally but that starts with how we kind of really nurture that talent and how and how we work with those young 
uh, black people at a young age because I think if the soil is toxic it's pretty impossible to grow anything uh, fertile out of that but if we kind of can nurture this really um, nourishing soil then I think you know what we could grow potentially could be quite amazing if given the chance and if equality actually could exist in a truer in, a tr in its true sense of the, of the word. Thank you very much. Um, that's very interesting. Um, you just touch on something else, which I've got a couple more minutes before I open it for questions. So I'll just, um, I think I'll pass this to Dr. Jivraj um, in her studies. Maybe there's something she can share. Uh, one of the things that the DFE itself has highlighted is that um, I think they've got a statement of intent for their workforce um, diversity, diversity strategy. And within the strategy, it said schools um, should foster uh, an, uh, an environment for social cohesion. Um, and it's important for people to grow in such an environment where uh, it's visible, divert, they see visibility of um, role models. I personally believe that um, in terms of exclusion and the relationships that you talk, um, that you all spoke about, that if we, if our young children were seeing more teachers from black background, um, they would, you know, it will make a big difference. And there's something that we can do to support the achievement, you know, for people to get up that ladder. So I don't know, in your role, uh, Dr. Jivraj, is there anything that you are doing or you are uh, looking at in, in terms of um, increasing uh, the, or decreasing the deficit of uh, black head teachers because that's a problem not just in our borough but uh, across the um the uk so i don't know if there's anything that you're doing any studies you're looking at to see how do we narrow the gap and bring more or encourage more um black or give the opportunity for black uh head teachers um to come to to surface and is there anything that you can recommend that greenwich count that can be done within the borough um, to address this issue as well? Well, um, that's like a massive question. Um, <laughs> um, well, what I can say is that, you know, I have two children at school in Kent and one's my daughter, she's a teenager, 14 going on 15, and um, she had one black teacher um, a couple of years ago and when that teacher left, she was just devastated. This year, she's just started back again, and um, she's got a new uh, black teacher in science, actually, and she's very science orientated. So she, and again, she, it, what a difference it's made to her. Um, come, but coming back to your question, um, what I am looking towards is working with um, schools that are supported. So Kent, the University of Kent has partner schools that they support um some some of them actually mainly in the in the medway region um and those schools have you know articulated that they are struggling and they've had various incidents which are really appalling um and it goes back to that thing of like you know how how do i tackle this how can we get started so there is a real need for support and very little that's helpful coming from the dfe or anywhere else at the government level um, but I would say that I think it's a really tricky process. It requires a lot of um, support, funding primarily. And we know that, you know, black scholars in particular um, do not get funding. They just do not get funded um, in the, you know, anywhere close to um, even their fellow scholars of colour. I have a colleague at the moment who's uh, campaigning uh, with the UKRI and their Arts and Humanities Research Council in particular because um, the last round of um, research that went out on COVID related issues um, with an EDI focus, zero of that funding, like zero pence, went to black scholars. Um, so yes, I'd love to say that, you know, something is, there is something afoot, but actually getting support from it, um, leadership needs to come from the top so it would be great if Greenwich Council can really get on board and support and say you know to the AHRC and UKRI you need to fund this sort of work we need this we need scholars on board to support us with our schools 
to do this work because there are you know there are jason has done great work there are scholars out there willing to do it but jason and i know because we you know we often work together and he supported our students at kent that when we have applied for funding for things it's it's really it's really tough okay thank you um it, no th those are really interesting points and i think um uh we a few people i've seen i can see some hands already going up i think people will pick those points up